come back. Um, but I brought some friends, um, and some very, very learned, learned friends as well. In fact, this fellow immediately to my left, Jim Tripp, has been a friend of mine since the uh, since the 70s. Um, and it's really a delight to have him here um, with us. He's the general counsel of the Environmental Defense Fund. Um, uh, Steve, Steve Morosky uh, is one of the newest members of the academic community, as I understand it. Some of you may uh, may not even have known that, but Steve uh, is now at the University of South Florida. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but obviously uh, known to, to many of you as a, an advisor for National Marine Fisheries at NOAA for a number of years, and have been involved in those issues for many years, and, and someone I know people look to um, on these issues was active in the NOAA's oil spill activities. Um, uh, Jim Ayers is one of my new friends. I um, hope, hope uh, Jim and I get to uh, uh, know each other, other better, as he's had a, uh, what probably feels to him like a lifetime of, of experience uh, dealing with another uh, well-known oil spill in the uh, Prince William Sound in, in Alaska, known as the Exxon Valdez. Um, he was very, uh, very involved with that. Um, um, he's now with uh, Alaska Strategy as a, a conservation consulting firm, but he was also uh, in many roles, uh, including, as I recall, chief of staff to the Alaska governor during the, the uh, spill years and worked uh, on the Oil Spill Trustee Council, uh, where they pretty much put, put together their, their program from scratch. And he's here to, uh, to help us think through um, some of what we might want to think about as we put together this new, uh, new venture that, uh, that uh, Lisa Jackson is chairing that I've been asked to uh, serve as staff director for, the Gulf Coast Ecosystem Restoration Task Force. Um, and uh, Jim's already said, well, you want to look at this, you don't want to think about that, do you? you know, so we're, we're, we're really, I'm, I'm going to drag him into my office and pick his brain clean before the day's over, so I hope you all will start that process for me. And uh, Another very good friend, um, uh, Cindy Doner with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. She's the regional director uh, in Atlanta. Um, some of you may know that I, I did a stint in Atlanta as the regional administrator of EPA there, and we had a very good working relationship um, uh, with Fish and Wildlife Service with Cindy and uh, uh, Sam Hamilton, who was there when I was when I was there, and um, uh, she's she's really um, and some, she's in so many roles involved with the. Natural Resources uh, Damages Assessment, the uh, Task Force, the uh, Federal Administrator and all this. That she tells me that it's easy for her to have a meeting on these issues, so she, all she has to do is talk to herself. So um, I always try to limit that a little bit, but uh, I don't want to get too, too carried away. So we have a, a very good group. <coughs> I may not be able to resist chiming in a little bit uh, on some of this as well, but uh, I don't think this is a shy group, so I don't think we're going to have any any trouble um, and listening uh, um, responses from these folks. Um, uh, Chip gave an excellent, where did Chip go? Chip gave an excellent presentation on restoration and the challenges that, uh, that we face. Um, um, we, I heard some of the impacts panel and uh, we're going to talk about restoration more than just the restoration of, of the uh, components of the oil spill, but we're going to talk about sort of a larger picture, as, as uh, Chip did, about restoration in the Gulf. Um, and uh, so um, with that, I'm, I guess they, they, uh, they ran out of budget to hire another, uh, another uh, journalist, um, so I'm going to be Geraldo Rivera today and uh, uh, get to ask questions. Uh, um, uh, Cindy Donner already struck one of my questions that I had, but uh, anyway, if he... If she doesn't behave, I'll go back to it, Cindy. So I'm just telling you right now, you know, those things in Las Vegas, and they don't stay there. So let me just tell you that uh, um, we can always bring that up. Um, the first the first I'd like to do is um, kind of set the, set the table um, um, to, to let our panelists talk about what what is the uh, um, what is the most significant uh, issue in the Gulf, and not so much as an issue, first of all, start as a resource. You know, I like to start with the positive. Why should we care about the Gulf of Mexico? I and mean, why is it such a, an important and wonderful place? And then what is your concern about that in terms of, of, of a threat that requires restoration? And then we'll talk more specifically about restoration and what, uh, what we might, might do in trying to address some of those concerns. Jim, you want to start us off? Well, the first part of that question is, you know, why should we be concerned about the Gulf? Uh, from a national point of view, 
Um, it's a beautiful area. Culturally, it's distinctive. Um, the Gulf is uh, a very productive uh, fishery. Um, a large part of, although I knew John from Florida work that I did uh, quite a while ago, early in my EDF career, um, a large part of my work has been in Louisiana, uh, concerned with what's happening to the uh, Mississippi Delta uh, ecosystem. Um, but there are very important national assets uh, located uh, in the Gulf, and particularly uh, in the in the coastal Louisiana area, uh, something like one third of the oil and gas infrastructure in the United States, uh, tremendously important uh, navigation shipping uh, lanes, uh, not only the Mississippi River, but the Gulf Intracoastal uh, uh, Waterway, um, important uh, for tourism. So one can make the case, both from an economic and, and uh, environmental point of view, uh, that um, the Gulf is very important. Um, and I would focus it uh, uh, very particularly on uh, the Delta. Um, now, what should we be concerned about? Um, you know, a couple of the oil speakers sort of uh, suggested the oil spill was uh, sort of a burp or something like that. Um, the oil spill I see more of as being sort of a classical point source of pollution, just a real punch. Um, but the basso continuo of Gulf degradation is the ongoing decline and collapse of the delta of the Mississippi River, coastal Louisiana, uh, and of course the tremendous uh, pouring of nutrients uh, into the Gulf. And both of those issues, if we're really seriously going to talk about restoration, yes, we have to talk about the other four states, obviously the Everglades, uh, but the central focus has to be on the uh, restoration of the Delta. Well, good. Uh, so I certainly want to amplify on the ecosystem services that um, we just talked about. That uh, it, Apparently it's the 29th largest economy in the world, and that's important in its own right, but, but it really... The 29th largest water body in the world. Okay. Um, I, I do think that we need to focus on the fact that the, uh, the Gulf is the gateway to the Midwest. And when we talk about the Gulf, we talk about the five Gulf states, but really it's the entire watershed that we're talking about. And so when we do that, we see that it opened up, opens up the economies for all the uh, communities along the Mississippi and Missouri rivers and others. And so, so what happens there and then what, uh, in terms of its, their impact on the Gulf and what the impacts on the Gulf are to the rest of that Midwest economy is important. The other point I'd like to make is that uh, uh, it's not like Las Vegas. What happens in the Gulf doesn't necessarily stay in the Gulf. You know, for example, a bluefin tuna will spawn there, and uh, it will go all the way to Cape Breton, and sometimes cross back and forth in, to the Atlantic. And so, so in a very real sense, it's an export conveyor for the rest. I of the think world. that uh, the previous panel, as well as Jim and Steve, have covered it pretty well. I just, I, I think Steve's point about how what happens in the Gulf affects the rest of of not only probably uh, the United States, but uh, in many ways, like the bluefin tuna, uh, tuna sea turtles, uh, as well as the fact that you're talking about a six to eight hundred million dollar a year fishery that feeds uh, a great part of America, provides seafood, and second only to Alaska, of course. Um, but perhaps more importantly, what the Gulf is is telling us today is that. These large marine ecosystems of our country make us who we are, economically and culturally. And I suspect that the Gulf is telling us that, and that's probably one of the most important features of what's happening. And it isn't just the deep water horizon. It's just the blow, as Jim Tripp said, on top of 70 years of degradation. But all of those things that we're talking about, from bluefin tuna to the shrimp, uh, uh, the migratory uh, marine mammals, all are a part of who we are, and yet we're now being asked, do we care enough, or is it? I think Steve important? said it was a gateway to the Midwest, and uh, John, correct me if I'm wrong, the Mississippi River drains 41% of the continent. That's a lot that comes down. There's several flyways that go through the Gulf. There's over 400 species of bird that spend some time in the Gulf and tens of millions that migrate through. If we're talking about fish and wildlife resources, there's hundreds of species of fish, 40 endangered species, and I could go on and on about the importance of the fish and wildlife and the habitat that's down there. Not only that, 
like Jim said, the communities and the economy that's down there and the life that we have in the Gulf and the people that live there. Could you, could you talk a little bit more about the, uh, um, the, the deep water part of the Gulf? This is a part that, when you're looking across the Gulf, it doesn't look any different than the rest of it, but there is a real uh, miraculous world down there. Are, there. are there concerns that you have in terms of restoration that uh, we need to look at for the, uh, the deep water part of the Gulf? Well, absolutely. I think, you know, we have focused a lot on what's happening in the marshes and what's happening in the relatively shallow areas. But remember, the, uh, the well itself was a mile deep, and that certainly wasn't even among the deepest of the wells. Uh, many wells over 10,000 feet of water, and, and, and certainly deeper than that. Uh, if you look at the um, geography of the Gulf of Mexico, the average depth is over a mile. Uh, it's, a, it's a very deep system that comes very close to land. Um, there's a lot of concern these days about what might be uh, longer term impacts at the bottom, uh, seafloor bottom. Um, there's a substantial deep coral and biogenic uh, community in that region. Um, more and more evidence that um, there's residual oil on the bottom. Uh, as well as drilling mud and other things. And so um, one thing we, we know, and I think Chip uh, alluded to this, that our ability to actually um, do restoration activities uh, as opposed to monitor and, uh, and protect uh, is a lot different in, in those kinds of habitats. And so uh, one would expect that the recovery rates of long-lived and slow-growing animals are going to be much different than what's at the surface and what's at, at the salt marsh. Um, there was some. Uh, there was a question earlier about protected areas. Were protected areas be part of the the uh, restoration toolbox in terms of uh, fisheries? Do you think there's there's issues there that, that need to be looked at in a larger a larger look at the Gulf? Well, there's an interesting uh, view in, in uh, natural resource management in the oceans, um, and that is, you know, what is the, the totality of all the uh, protection measures that you've got going? Um, the fishery management councils in the region have recently enacted measures to end overfishing. That doesn't necessarily mean that resources are on a, uh, you know, a close path to rebuilding, but nevertheless, those are in play and they have to be accounted for. Um, there are a number of protected areas already in the region that, that are either seasonal or long-term closures. From the point of view of restoration, you know, how would marine protected areas actually work? And in this case, um, they might be viewed as compensatory restoration as opposed to direct restoration. And that is, um, uh, is there a certain threat out there that if you abated it, that it would actually provide some other service or a compensatory service to what was destroyed? And so one would have to look very closely at what the nature of the current threats are um, to actually design a, an MPA that would be effective in this as, compensation. As land protection, either restoration um, protection through easements or acquisition, when you're talking about the habitat, you're talking about the marsh and you're talking about the beaches, if you think about long-term restoration, and when you factor in all the other things, not only about the natural resource damage assessment, but the long-term restoration process that you have to go through with the task force and the developing the plan with the state and the other partners, you have to think about things like sea level rise and taking the lands that we have and making sure that we connect those so that we have connectivity with the habitats that we already do have protected and we already have under some type of restoration planning process. So I would envision that in the future you would have to do that. But I would ask you as part of the task force, if you consider that. Yes, I think the, the um, um, and I'm going to come, come right back to you as you talk a little bit about the uh, relationship of the murder process and ours and then go back into some of the, see if, um, I know um, uh, Jim Harris wants to talk a bit about some things that we need to, we need to keep in mind as we go forward from here, all moving forward in this direction. But, uh, you know, the, um, I think protection and preservation are certainly part of the mission of, um, of the um, restoration is envisioned by the executive order that uh, President Obama issued last October, um, and uh, that's both land, land, land protection and, and, and resource habitat protection, um, and uh, so I think that, that very much is part of our, our mission. I think um, um, in terms of sea level rise, uh, you know, if you look at, for example, at the Mississippi uh, Coastal Impact Program, it also included rebuilding um, some of the barrier islands there that are not only important habitat, particularly for birds and, and other, and create wetland habitat behind them, but they also help um, slow down storm surge. And we have to we have to build in all those components uh, into our into our restoration strategies. We're going to move move forward. Yeah, on. Cindy, uh, um, um, 
since you do serve in both roles very actively and, and involved with the NOTA process and with the task force, could you uh, sort of take a moment and kind of explain to folks? People get confused about um, what, the, uh, what the goals and the different authorities that, that are involved there. So the natural resource damage assessment and restoration process is a process that was um, developed after the Exxon um, spill with uh, the Oil Pollution Act of 1990, and it's a process that allows um, those entities that have trust resources, lands, um, migratory birds, things like that, uh, that are impacted from the oil spill to go forward and do an assessment of the impacts. So in this natural resource damage assessment, the Deepwater Horizon, NERDA, um, we do have a trustee council established. The members of that council are the five states, the Department of Interior, NOAA, DOD, and we all have trust resources. Affected uh, federally recognized tribes can also be part of this process if they have resources that were impacted, but at this time no tribes have come forward, although we do know some that are looking into whether or not they need to be part of it. What the process does is to restore the natural resources that were impacted to pre-spill. So what we need to do is work hard to take, uh, to do um, a thorough analysis of what the impacts were from the oil to the natural resources. And it includes all types of resources as we're going forward. So you have impacts to the lands, you have impacts to the fish, to the wildlife, the deep water habitat, but you also have impacts that look at lost use. So lost recreational use, not you weren't able to use the lands that you have that are um, public lands or state lands for recreational op opportunity. You also heard Steve talk about compensatory mitigation. So there's primary mitigation and compensatory. Primary is making sure that you clean up the marshes that were damaged, how many acres, and determining that. Through the process, what you have to do is you have to assess the impact determine that there was a, the impact, document the release, identify those resources that are impacted. You have to demonstrate the pathway. So you have to go through the process. Once you demonstrate the pathway, you have to calculate, calculate what the injuries are, and then you have to figure out how you restore it. Through OPA, it is a public process that you go forward th with, so the public is involved in the restoration planning, but it's also a legal process. So as we go through, it is a legal process and we have to work through the process of working on these studies um, very thoroughly and making sure that we have the right experts because we have to use sound science, the best science. So as the five states, as the trustee council goes forward and we develop working groups for the different resources that we think have been injured, we do pull the best scientists. So we have universities involved and different scientists from the communities involved in that process. The difference between the trustee council and the NERDA process and the task force is BP is the responsible party that will pay for these injuries for the public. The task force will do restoration above and beyond what the oil spill has caused. So the, you've heard people talk about the long-standing ecological degradation of the system. So working to restore this system to a sustainable, healthy system, a resilient system. So when we look at the task force and the NERDA process, we look how we can work together to complement each other. Um, well, um, my understanding is that, you know, in, in theory, at the end, end of the day, the trustee agencies come up with a, a dollar figure that uh, represents the cost of cleaning up the oil, undoing the damage, um, but it can also provide for compensatory mitigation or restoration. So um, it's quite possible that um, a lot of the oil on the, on the bottom of the Gulf, uh, the oil in the marshes, can't be removed. Um, or it would be better just to leave it there and let natural processes take their place. Um, it might be a better, <clears throat> so what do we do with that money? Um, well, therefore, some of that money, NERDA money, could be used um, in, in compensatory restoration that could in, include, uh, you know, uh, restoring some of the wetlands of coastal Louisiana or some of the lost mangrove swamps uh, uh, in the Everglades uh, and so on. Um, correct. You could through compensatory but, mitigation, and Steve alluded to that on how you can use that. So you can use it, but it needs to have a nexus to the injury, but in the Gulf, we do see 
how um, one of the big things that we're looking at is the overall impact to the ecosystem, which is tied to, uh, you know, the web. Yeah. Um, right. Really requires some kind of reasonable ecological nexus, but it seems to me we have that nexus in spades. <laughs> let me uh, let me back up. Yeah, you, you, yeah, I know you you want to kind of give us a little little perspective as we go uh, into our processes here. So a great uh, deal of this is not new. We we have not, as a nation, decided that we care enough about these large marine ecosystems to identify why they're important. We uh, two previous panels actually. Uh, Dr. Peterson talked about this a little bit. We have not looked at the ecology of what makes these ecosystems work, and then, as Steve was pointing out, how important they are. That makes the discussion about restoration, then, all the more difficult. And yet, we know, in this particular case, now we're going to go down, and we did this in the Exxon Valdez in Alaska. We had down a track of NERDA, uh, Natural Resource Damage Assessment, and we look at individual species and so forth. But the real issue is the 70 years of damage where we haven't paid attention to the large marine ecosystem. And then we get into the question, the larger question, do we want to restore the Gulf of Mexico to a sustainable, resilient ecosystem capable of producing uh, you know, uh, sustainable uses like the fisheries, the shipping, and so forth? And if we do, and I'll just, I'll just go through this, whether you look at Chesapeake Bay or the Great Lakes uh, the Exxon Valdez, there's five big pieces. The first is you've got to have a management structure, and, and, and we're going to find, John, the, the, the steel of your makeup and the lessons of your children, and uh, what's going to come very rapidly about managing the, 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 the laundry. Uh, no, it'll be a list and a long line with people with their Christmas list for the money. But the first is to have a management structure with a peer review science team looking at what's happening, including, and they'll have two tools, NERDA, but they'll also have the other information about the big projects that we know are necessary that Jim Tripp was talking about. The second is a restoration fund, and it must be more than just the NERDA. It has to be a restoration fund. It's one of the things we learned uh, at the Exxon Valdez, you see in the Great Lakes or, or Chesapeake Bay, uh, a, a restoration fund capable of funding the big three-legged stool, as someone talked about it, which is restoration projects, those big ones, like Jim's working on, and like hypoxia, and like restoring and creating a fisheries uh, restoration program that Pete Peterson was talking about of the uh, oyster reefs uh, and, and uh, the seagrasses. And then creating a research and monitoring program, long-term research and monitoring program. Now, uh, the previous panel talked about, well, we got a, BP's got something going through their grant program. But we need to have an integrated, we, we, we were three years into the Exxon Valdez before we realized, Cindy and I were talking about this, you really need a research and monitoring program that's going to look at the Gulf, look at everything from the birds to what's happening to uh, the hydrocarbon influence on bluefin tuna embryos. And that is not going to be known for a long period of time, but we need to invest now. Those five big pieces are what makes up restoration. But if it doesn't get established early on, where you look at the projects like Jim's talking about, and you incorporate NERDA into that, and you have a science panel that includes peer review and a monitoring and research program I'm going to say one more thing, uh, if you allow me, John. The mistake we made at the Exxon Valdez is we settled with Exxon for $900 million. And I came in shortly, well, I was involved during the negotiation. But shortly thereafter, I, I became the executive director of the fund. Two years later, as we were designing this, as an architect of this thing, we realized we really needed to have, we needed to reach in, and, and uh, Bill Riley and Don talked about this, we needed to reach in and create a long-term research and monitoring program because the ecosystem is too important to this country to just take it uh, for a two-year, uh, I'll just say, expenditure. We need to invest in these big projects and a research and monitoring program and we need to do it at the initial. So the $900 million, in my view today, which should be much larger for our good friends from BP, they can afford it. But that, that should happen at the settlement. Murder and the Clean Water Act is inconsequential 
if it's a lump sum payment, everybody gets their Christmas list and it's over. It, there needs to be at settlement the investment in a long-term research and monitoring program, and maybe the stream of payments, as, as President Obama so wisely did with BP or whoever put that together, Geithner or whoever dreamed that up, is a long-term payment plan from BP, and I suspect that's the next 20 or 25 years ought to be a stream of payments into that restoration fund. I'll just stop. But those, those are things we learned from the Exxon Valdez that we would do differently today. And from hypoxia to fishery management and adaptive, moving to adaptive management that would come out of that, and the Mississippi River uh, and other wetlands restoration program are a big part of what ought to be an overall restoration plan. If you piecemeal it and spend it, You'd be sorry in 10 years. That's the short version. Jim, you, you mentioned when we were, when we were talking um, that I asked you, was there anything that, that you discovered that if, if you'd have had a good science program in place to begin with, would have been, been useful information in your restoration? You gave me, you gave me two examples. So you want to, I'm going to go ahead and let you take a little more time, and then I'll, uh, I'll move, move, move down, the, down the line here a little sure, bit. Sure, and, and Pete Peterson, well, there's a couple instructor. other really smart scientists here that, that uh, they were my advisors at the time, by the way. They, they, uh, uh, they were very helpful, and, and uh, I, I haven't thanked them uh, frequently or often enough, but they, they, they led me through this effort of what does restoration mean? And two that, that come to mind, and, and I don't mean this as a derogatory comment about the industry, but they kept talking about prevention and, and, uh, prevention and uh, containment and cleanup. We didn't talk about restoration, and, and we didn't talk about it, but we think we know a lot because we're the species that we are. But in fact, as Nancy and other people have demonstrated, we know very little about the, the marine ecology and the Gulf of Mexico. In Alaska, we, there was a presumption that all would be found because it was washed ashore, and you saw the pictures of them steam cleaning it, which we've all learned a lesson there, that you'd find this oil in the upper tidal zone or in the back part of the marshes in this case. But later, after seven or eight years of research, Dr. Jeff Short, uh, also one of the, uh, my great advisor and great friend, discovered that in fact the oil was being found in the lower level, two, two or three feet deep in the intertidal zone, and having lingering effects. That was one. And the other has to do with herring. And herring uh, it was something that everyone assumed would recover so quickly, and yet we're 20 years later and there's still a great bit of debate about why herring from that stress. And they got blown away, and people assumed they'd recover because herring's so prolific in, in Prince William Sound, but they still have. Those two were dramatically uh, were big dramatic surprises to us and were terrible uh, and are still not really understood today. <laughs>